There's some interesting pieces in here. This is in the chapter on language. He talks about, um, he says that Voltaire and Rousseau, among others, had to flee in their time uh, from those whose anger uh, was aroused by what they had written. Can anyone imagine that a philo philosophical tract written today would so infuriate the public or even government officials that its author would have to flee the country? Uh, philosophy professors no and he also says here actually it is hard to imagine this not only because in the West at least we do not jail unpleasant writers uh, well Canada we we have a bit of that going on actually you might have heard of uh, Mark Stein or Ezra Levant had some problems with with uh, Canadian stuff which is terrible but anyways um, I'll continue on the quote here it says but also because both the interest and language of professional philosophers are too specialized and therefore too inaccessible that is to say who cares what they write and who, who understand, uh, understands it the main point here is that enlightenment essayists were popular they were even famous or in several cases notorious so of course that was um, Voltaire and Rousseau the point is is that these people were engaging the public enough that they were making them mad over their ideas because they were of course criticizing religion or like you can you definitely uh, Voltaire was was pretty notorious for criticizing stuff making fun of stuff like in Candide for example uh, but um, the point is is that these people were public intellectuals it's the public intellectuals that are that are engaging with progress today not the specialized highly technical professors um, who they're it, it's really hard to judge the actual impact of what they write but we can see the impact of what are called public intellectuals people like Christopher Hitchens uh, Mark Stein like writers um, people writers but not just people who write in the newspaper because I'm not sure how much that stuff's even read anyways I'm talking about people who go to debates who who have um, big public spectacles like all the atheist debates that happened when Hitchens was around and Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins those are public intellectuals and they and only one of them was a PhD uh, the other two uh, Sam Harris now has one but he never had one when he was doing that stuff um, so those are the ones that engage with the public not the specialized literature and so did the enlightenment the enlightenment had these public intellectuals he also mentions that everyone essentially everyone associated with the US Constitution were all lawyers they were not political professors they were lawyers they were again public intellectuals just a quick point I, I want to make we're in the language chapter still he says here that many people, uh, I'm just going to paraphrase it, he says that many people believe that the, the people who are really criticizing language really starts with those French philosophers such as Jacques Derrida and Michael, uh, Michel Foucault and Jacques Lacan and, and um, Jean uh, Bar Bardrillard. Uh, but he actually says that no, um, that, that, that this was happening already. Um, by many uh, by physicists he says Einstein Bohr Eddington and Heisenberg uh, were already discussing um, their uh, their relativity theory was actually before what the French philosophers were saying and that relativity theory was questioning our use of the terms such as time time and space and similarity and things like that so that might be if you're interested in that that might be something to look into and also um, Wittgenstein, of course, who who thought that I wasn't a physicist though. Um, he thought that not only is language a vehicle for expression, that's used that's a common sense view. That language is a vehicle of expression. We have some idea in our head, and to express that idea we try to we use language, and sometimes we get the wrong word or we have to um, use multiple words to somehow describe how we're feeling or what we're thinking about. But Wittgenstein says, and this was what made a, well, this is what, what was such a big deal, is that language is not just a vehicle for expression. This is what these people are saying. It's also the driver of expression. That the language, the, the language we use, whether it's English, 
or French or Japanese or whatever you might whatever you might speak or know that that language is a is a like a cell a, a, it's a prison it 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 already alters how you think about things because you necessarily must think about them with this with a language that you have it the various languages that that we know of on that uh, that we know of on earth that they necessarily put our ideas into a framework and then what these people are saying is that this framework is altering uh, altering our meaning or somehow confining us and what they want to do is they want to bring out what that framework is what is that thing that's confining us or, or biasing us or whatever but I always thought that was a strange idea because if it is true that we are confined and trapped in our language how do we come up with new words it seems to me that we actually have ideas we have thoughts and that we translate those into language and when we don't know a word we use other words to try to get to it to what we mean and in some cases we invent new words I don't understand how the pro the premise of being trapped in a language how does that explain being able to devise new words it would seem to me that if you you could never think beyond the words you have in your head but how would you invent new words in, or new concepts so anyways that's my take on that but so on page 73 he gives an example um, from Shakespeare he says uh, you probably heard this quote before a rose by any name would smell as sweet which is true uh, postman says but it is also true that a rose by any name, say garbage weed, would smell quite different, as any advertising executive knows. So here's the point. So Shakespeare's quote says that a rose by any name would smell would smell as sweet, meaning he's saying here that the word doesn't matter; um, it will still smell nice. But Postman's saying, oh, actually, no. If you tried to sell a rose, you could sell it. But if you tried to sell a rose as garbage weed, you call it garbage weed, you put a sticker on it and say this is garbage weed, you will have trouble selling it. You will you'll have a harder time selling it. And Postman might even say, and some of the language people would say this too, if you, you can do a little experiment. You give someone a rose and ask them how it smells and maybe they'll say it smells nice, right? That is your data point. Okay. Now find someone else and ask them, here's some garbage weed I found. And maybe not. Maybe they can't see how it looks. So you can only only the smell they get, but it's wrapped up so they can't see it. You you give them here. Try smelling this. It's called garbage weed. They will smell it, and they will smell something a little different. Well, but they they won't smell anything different. But they will think it's different, and they will interpret it differently, or they it biases them in some way. And if you did this survey, and all you're doing, all you're using is roses. All you have is roses, but you've wrapped them up, and to some people you say, here, it's a rose, how does it smell? And you say to other people, here, here's garbage weed, how does it smell? You're going to get a different result, because you have biased, you have prejudiced your um, participants. And so that's the point here, is that these words um, do, change, do alter our, how we interpret reality that's that's what the point they're making here that that's what they're arguing and there's even a quote here from Thomas Hobbes in the Leviathan and Thomas Hobbes says understanding is nothing else than conception caused by speech you may know that Hobbes was a materialist and he believes he believed in essentially in determinism that that our thoughts are actually caused by some kind of incoming perception and so when someone's speaking to us that speech causes all our thoughts and that language then spits out something that maybe we say so it's like a mechanical process right now he starts discussing postmodernism which is kind of what we have today he says here that at least this isn't a quote I'm just paraphrasing it uh, this is on page 74 he says that at least enlightenment thinkers while they criticized um, what language could could give us or 
they at least believe that language could provide us with what what, he, uh, what they call transcendent truths. But the postmodernist thinks that it cannot connote any truth. And what it reminded me of is that Plato actually said that that the transcendent truths, the the, um, the, uh, the forms, um, they could they were they were ineffable, meaning that they could not be put into language. That language is uh, not a perfect, not a perfect thing, not a perfect way of of discussing these forms, these these perfect ideas. And the Enlightenment people did think that they could, but the postmodernists are back to that they can't. But they can't denote any truth, anything at all. And you might have heard of such things as like the social construction of reality that's all relative and, but in any case my own take on it is I always thought it was kind of strange that and Postman actually discusses this on page 79 he says that um, he's saying that they have a problem of how, what standard they use to uh, if, if you can interpret any text in any way you like, to what standard do you disqualify certain readings? Because would that not put you down the path of an infinite regress of that anything goes? And of course, the most modernists hate anything goes because they know it's a, it's a problem. But they don't provide any standards for judgment. They think that you can read Shakespeare, you can read Othello for what Shakespeare thinks about jealousy. Or you can interpret Othello to be talking about a hockey game. Um, they don't provide any basis to standardize uh, and to judge that. And that you can get anything out of that text and that the author does not make the, make, make the meaning. Um, the, the, you've probably heard of the death of the author, for example. In any case, I always thought it was strange that these people use language to deny language. Um, presumably Derrida's text can also be interpreted. But then, Derrida, why did he write it? Like I, I, it just seems like a lot of this postmodernism is self-defeating. Uh, they, they assume objectivity, but then deny objectivity. 